Microtransactions are back in the news following the revelation that one player spent $150,000 in the mobile game Transformers Earth War. A presentation given by Henry Fong, the CEO of the game's operator Yodo One, has sparked questions about in-game monetization and the moral responsibility that companies have to protect the financial well-being of their customers. Hey everyone and welcome back to another industry report. This time we're taking a look at nuanced monetization strategies and the link between gameplay and business models. Of course, before we begin, be sure to like, sub and ring that bell to let the YouTube algorithm know that you like what we're doing. Okay, let's get into it. So, Henry Fong's speech was delivered as part of the Game Connect Asia Pacific Conference, where he was the host of a more extensive session with two of Yoda One's clients. So, the session was entitled, Making Great Money to Make Great Games. And and it involved Hipster Whale, the studio behind Crossy Road, and Featherweight Games, the creator of Rodeo Stampede. So the Yoda One CEO has a long history of financial success. He outlines how he got into the games industry through a love of video games and a talent for making money, something that has served him quite well in the mobile gaming sphere. Fong reveals that he made his first million at Microsoft and then made a few more after that, but who's counting? Yeah, quite the guy, Mr. Fong. So his current life involves making multiple millions with Yoda One, and then flipping houses in Macau, which is a detail that, well, nobody asked for, but they got it anyway. Now, the big number of the whole presentation was the 150 grand spent in Transformers Earth War, and So Fong uses Transformers as an example in his discussions of monetization strategies. He reveals that he used to believe that the game audience would basically just leave if it was over monetized, but he's since discovered that the opposite is true. Fong admits that it's challenging to get players to actually spend money in a game, but once they do, they actually spend quite a lot indeed. Transformers 30-day retention rate for paid users was 85%, which to him indicates that once players spend some money, they stick around to justify that investment and they will likely spend more. That's just human psychology. Fong then also touched on some other experiments in monetization, such as one that he calls price elasticity analysis. This strategy involves designing purchase options with a particular price point in mind. The intention is that, quote, if you're a kid, or someone who can't afford to spend thousands on a game will price it so high that you won't even consider looking at it. Now, Fong's example is a $300 value with a $1,000 valuation that he believes would only appeal to people who could comfortably afford it. Incidentally, this is about as close as Fong gets to actually addressing vulnerable consumer protection. Now, Fong and Yodo One's big idea is linked to artificial intelligence. So, Featherweight Games' Rodeo Stampede has over 100 million downloads and... Uh, big player might spend a couple of hundred bucks for it. But then, of course, you've got Transformers, where it has a 150 grand spender. So in terms of profitability, it makes a lot of sense for companies such as Yodo One to keep track of those big spenders, as Fong says that knowing them and knowing how to manage them is extremely important. So for this, Yodo One has been developing an AI application to identify the big spenders. This unnamed app has had access to over two and a half years of purchase behaviors and monetization data collected from the player base. And Fong says that currently, the application has an 87% success rate in identifying potential whales, with his ultimate goal being to bring that up to 95%. Now, by identifying accurately possible whales, the team can then devise strategies to help keep them spending money in the game. Now, the application looks at purchase patterns and how often a player actually spends money, the sort of things they buy, the amount of time spent playing, and how long they actually play. Now, Fong emphasizes that this is a vast amount of data, which would be incredibly difficult for a human to handle. Time is a massive factor there, Fong basically just reckons it would take like a human brain, you know, a year to crunch what the AI can do in a day, which, I mean, if you know how computers works, makes complete sense. Now, speaking with Kotaku Australia after the fact, Fong also revealed that this AI could be trained to promote catered monetization packages to specific players. Now, this is an idea that they ultimately scrapped because of the foreseeable backlash from players. Moreover, Fong said that the studio didn't want to create a situation whereby different people pay different prices for the same thing, which is, uh, well, I suppose an odd amount of restraint from the company. A recurring argument against monetization strategies that are, I guess, you know, being quite exploitative is that they technically never put players under any pressure or obligation to spend. And Fong himself uses this argument on several occasions during his presentation. He basically appears to have an unwavering belief that no amount of monetization, you know, strategy pressure can exert a real pressure on the player. Breaking his own experiences in spending money in games, Fong declares that if I don't want to spend, no one can make me spend. 
He also admits that he won't spend eight grand in a game in one month, but given his self-proclaimed wealth, I really, ma- like, I imagine that's just a drop in the bucket for him. Now, the thing is, if he's a sort of, you know, A-type personality, like aggressive, CEO, entrepreneurial type of person, yeah, he's probably less targetable by those things, but not everyone's going to be like him, so I really think he's got a pretty poor defense there. Indeed, a significant problem with the use of AI for targeted selling, as well as Fong's just general outlook on in-game purchases, is the idea that it entirely discounts, well, the possibility of a vulnerable consumer. Now, this Yodo One AI that is trained to identify players who will spend a lot of money in the game and then those who will not. So it is unable to take things into account such as, you know, can a player actually afford financially, you know, responsibly what they're spending. The AI has no provisions to account for that sort of nuanced, compulsive behavior. And as such, yeah, I think it's imposing a reckless pressure on somebody with, you know, compromised capacity for making financially rational decisions. Yoda One essentially want to promote compulsive spending while continuing to shirk the moral responsibility uh, for really, you know, what, what they're doing, like what the AI's actual like impact on the world would be. And ultimately, yeah, it's entirely legal for that to happen and everyone is making, you know, their purchase decision themselves, but that's the kind of thing that is just inviting regulation. Now, while there are arguments here that developers and publishers are on no obligation to control how much a player actually spends, you know, their money, well, it loses credibility when you've got these, like, you know, AI tools being employed with big data to target people specifically. I think when substantial amounts of in-game purchases actually hit the news, they're often accompanied with the important question, you know, how was this allowed to happen? Because it seems ridiculous to people. Hefty investments such as those reported in the Transformers game, and recently there were some Warframe examples and RuneScape, I mean, they do have a resonance with the public, and as I said, there's going to be regulation, I imagine. It speaks to a lack of safeguards in place to protect players, as well as the presence of systems that will further encourage spending, and basically companies not really thinking about what value are we going to provide a player in return for their money. It's more just what is the maximum we can get from the whales. Moreover, in a gacha game such as the Transformers one in question, I mean, how is it even possible to spend that much money in the game? It's insane. Shouldn't the collection be completed by a point? Okay, moving on, the Featherweight Games co-founder Dylan Bevis highlighted that monetization processes need to be considered from the design stage of a game, rather than just be implemented down the line. And this really does speak to an ingrained link between the game's design and its monetization, one that is virtually inescapable for the player. Some developers choose to implement things like soft caps on spending, maybe altering the percentages of gacha drops to ensure that players, you know, can complete their collection once they reach a defined payment threshold, something like that. Uh, Something actually similar sort of happened with Warframe. They removed a microtransaction option from their store because it was being used too much. The team essentially said they inadvertently made a highly abusable slot machine, and uh, the option was quickly removed from the game. But that said, a lot of Warframe players have reached out to me saying that what they did after that is also pretty questionable. But still, these sorts of moves, you know, they're at the discretion of developers but there sometimes is a lack of, you know, formal obligation, uh, you know, to actually take players' sort of well-being in mind, and that has got a lot more people calling for regulatory oversight. I think Fong's misguided celebration of his company's dealings with whales, that's, I mean, that's undoubtedly provoked a reaction here, most notably, actually, from one of Yoda One's clients. So, Space Ape Games are actually a UK-based developer, and they make Transformers Earth War, the game that had the massive spender, but uh, the operation of the game is handled solely by Yoda One in China. Now, Space Ape Games' co-founder and COO Simon Haid this week felt the need to clarify the studio's position concerning Fong's comments. Aside from emphasizing that the studio only developed the game, Haid said that chasing whales is not our strategy and our responsibility as a developer is to deliver a great game that players love to play. He added that their focus is to create a game that uh, people will enjoy for years and trust that monetization will follow. And what I'm going to say here is, nah, mate, you're making a gacha game. You know what's going on here. Don't try to pull the wool over us. I think, though, this illustrates, like, his studio was trying to get some distance from the whale debate, and I think it's pretty conclusively showing just how impactful Fong's comments have became, that even a gacha game game developer is actually dis- 
distancing itself from what Fong said. The role the games companies play in encouraging this sort of compulsive behavior is under increased public scrutiny these days. It's one of the primary issues that's fueling the kinds of political and legal concerns illustrated in the recent DCMS immersive and addictive technologies report that we covered in this channel. Fong's outlining of his company's AI-centric spending strategy just calls into question, you know, the whole, we don't force players to buy anything, we can't control what they do, kind of attitude of the highly monetized game space. You know, there's no, we're just providing players convenient options. I think it's pretty hard for a company to maintain a sense of moral distance from proceedings when they're literally training an AI to identify the most, I mean, the people are basically the most weak to monetization strategies. Simply put, I think this is a very bad look for the games industry in a time of heightened regulatory scrutiny. Fong's strategy on monetization is fundamentally, I mean, it's great for money making, but I mean, it's a bit naive. I mean, I don't think it's naive to the social issues. I think it knows them completely. It knows it's targeting vulnerable people. I just don't think they care at all. This sort of aggressive monetization just creates an environment that encourages compulsive spending. And when you're bolstering it through, uh, through AI, I mean, just on a systemic level, that's going to increase the amount of affected vulnerable people by a large degree. I think Fong is just showing a complete disregard for the fact that, uh, I mean, that compulsive behavior like, that's going to be targeted by an AI, but the more the AI is good at doing that and the more strategies are developed around those people, the more it's actually going to foster that vulnerability. And it really, I think that, like, the more clients they get and the more that is deployed at scale, I think that basically is a bad thing for the moral integrity of the games industry. It is just a, you know, a little robot money-making factory that he's running. I mean, hey, props to him for running a highly successful, very intelligent business and all that stuff. But sometimes you've got to just look away from the dollars and think about the externalities of your actions. And that is what Henry Fong, I think, has to do. Maybe he can just go back to flipping houses in Macau and just leave us out of it. Anyway, that's it for today's video. Thank you very much for watching, and with that, I will see you next time.